Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Let's Get Trashed. Today, I have my very good friend. Are we using your full name? I didn't even ask you about this. Do you want to do you trying to be anonymous? No, no, go All ahead. Right. I have nothing. Andres to Gonzalez on the pod with me. Uh, him and I have been friends for a long time. He is I'm going to call you a horror movie expert because you know way more about <laughs> it than I do. Um and any you know if you know anything more than I, I immediately call you an expert. <laughs> I'm surrounded by experts. That's a great system to use, actually. Yeah, um, I'm very generous with the word expert. <laughs> yeah, just just not with you know like uh, you know medical advice or any sort of life saving crisis service. You know, um, I yeah I'm I wouldn't call myself an expert in regular terms, but I have seen a lot of horror movies. I definitely around high school, I I got into them hardcore, and mm-hmm. ever since then I. It's pretty much the only movies that I watch anymore. Yeah, that's interesting. You know what? I was thinking about this in thinking about you being on the show today. Um, and I want to know why um, <clears throat> that it seems to me that like whenever somebody is a, a cinephile or like a real film buff or film expert, those people always tend to be horror fans as like their main genre. And you, I've seen it. You know, I, I've famously the only reference off the top of my head is like in the movie Juno. That's how that's how Juno and uh, the adopted father uh, Jason Bateman. Jason Bateman. That's, they yeah. bonded over. That was, that's like a cliche of like, oh, you like the same 1930s horror as I do. Awesome, and that you people bond over that. But that's such a common thing. Horror is like the main genre for film, true film lovers. Yeah. Um. I think it's definitely uh, it's it's niche enough enough people are just totally opposed to it, which I understand why. I'm not judging anyone that uh, it can bring people together. You know, you never have like romance movie clubs. Like no one's no one's like let's all yes. you like romantic comedies. Oh my god, that's like, such a great point. Um, but you know, horror. There's conventions. There's you know, there's groups. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, it feels good. I think for people to be able to connect with other people through this mutual love of something that maybe uh, some people don't understand why why you like it you know why do you want to be scared why do you want to feel negative emotions yeah um but there's something about it i think it it um there's like an exhilaration to it Mm -hmm. you know i'm always hunting for and i don't know i won't speak for all horror fans but i feel like i'm always hunting for something scary or something that's gonna upset me in some new way or yeah. really get under my skin you're looking for that adrenaline ru- adrenaline rush yeah yeah you know it's it's a real roller coaster and um yeah it just uh it, it hits the spot and speaking of horror movies that hit the spot uh-huh. uh the one we're talking about today pearl pearl um yeah it it, it uh it, it hit the spot for me that's great yeah um <clears throat> i famously I think, and by famously, I mean to the tw- to the twenty people that listen to this show. I think I've said multiple times that X is my favorite movie of this year, and I'm saying that as a dude who's not like, oh, you know, I I enjoy horror movies just fine, but that's not a genre. I'm not like you where I'm always seeking out the new horror thing, or or um, I'm I'm going I'm not going deep into horror. Yeah, my favorite horror movie ever I think is The Shining, which is probably most people's that are that's probably a very casual answer for you know a lot of people but i mean it's a brilliant film yeah it's, it's great yeah it, it's great but it's definitely very mainstream and stuff like yeah. that it's it's hardly a uh who's that italian guy um dario argento yeah it's hardly it's hardly a dario argento film or something that you have yeah. to like search for and there's probably people who would who you'd say dario argento and they'd be like that that plebeian like, exactly yeah that's a cliche answer that's uh, that's the one guy whose name i barely know but anybody in that actual horror realm would that's like the first to yeah me, to me that's a that's a that's how you know it's for real you're yeah. real yeah for me that's like oh you know that name you're obviously a big horror guy but people that are actually in that world are like he's the first step yeah you, you have to know that's the tip of that you're you're getting closer that's yeah just, you're you're under the water there's so much more um, um and yeah, uh, I actually just read a. I did a little bit of research, and by research I mean I did one Google search and clicked on the top answer, um, talking about how horror movies bond people, and it was about like 
that shared feeling of adrenaline, even if it's a movie you don't love as much, you come out liking it more if you watch it with a group of people and you and you can feel that sense of yeah. like everybody can feel that sense of camaraderie where they're feeling something. It um it bonds them closer. Uh that was like a study done. Again, according to a text website that I just saw, so who knows? But it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I mean, I'll say I think that in my experience, I have a more fun time, uh, a more scared time when I'm watching it with people who are also really into it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I love watching horror movies alone. I've I've seen I've seen tons of movies alone or with big groups and theaters. You know, all kinds of situations. But I think like that feeling of other people around you being scared. Yeah, there's something inside of us. I think that's like we're such social creatures. Like when there's a group of us and we're all scared, like it's even scarier. You know, it's greater than the sum of our parts. Um, yes, that's that's a great way to put it. That's exactly it. Like like it, like I said, even if it's not your favorite movie or whatever, just the fact that everybody else is feeling it with you maybe amplifies the experience. Yeah, and you, you leave with the, uh, you know, you leave with like rose tinted glasses of it or rose, you know, whatever the phrase is. Um, cool. Yeah. So, did you see Pearl in the theater with other people? I did. I did. I was, it was so. I um saw it the last weekend. It was in theaters, and there was um one theater playing it. It was about a uh, forty-five minute drive away from my house. Oh wow! Yeah, at ten thirty at night, and so I I checked out there, and there was almost no one else in the theater. Which theater was it? Uh, it was the Windrock up uh, in Pflugerville. Wow, there wasn't a draft house playing it anywhere closer? No, they were the last theater <laughs> that was playing really? it. Yeah, before it went out of theaters. Oh my goodness. They'll do they I don't know why, but sometimes you can only see certain movies there. Like I saw the lighthouse there. I've seen several movies there. At the Wind Rock in Pflugerville? In Pflugerville, yeah. Damn. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know you worked that hard for this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Listen, uh, I, I that's for me procrastinating because I was going to see it earlier in the week and a friend of mine was singing at Alamo and he even invited me and I was like, oh, I'm so tired. Yeah. I had a chance to see it at the, I mean, there was not, I, when I saw it, there was not a lot of Alamo showings even. It was like, it was waning. It was about to leave Alamo. I was like, oh crap. Um, it's, you know, <clears throat> I better, I better see it before it leaves. And it, it was already out of like some of the other theaters I go around to, but <clears throat> I bought a ticket and there was, I bought one, I, you know, you can select your seat. I bought a ticket in the afternoon and there was two other tickets sold. So I was like, this is going to be dead. Yeah. And it was the smallest theater they had to so only like five rows of chairs. But when I got there for that night for the, again, a 1045 showing. Yeah. It was packed. Oh, really? Yeah. A bunch of people must have bought tickets after I did. Um, but it was a pretty full room, uh, which was cool. It was a, I did like that experience. A late night movie on a Monday, yeah. I think it yeah, was. Yeah, that's cool to see, you know. Uh, 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 especially I mean, I mean I don't know I have a soft spot for movie theaters I think every time I go to an empty theater it's kind of nice mm-hmm. but I'm also just like man these aren't going to be around in a few years yeah. and it bums me out um, yeah so that's I, good to hear I was I'm coming back around on movie theaters yeah I'm, I was anti movie theaters for a long time Um. even even as you know recently as six months ago I think me and a uh, uh, on one of these episodes, in addition to talking about a movie, me and my friend Steve debated. He's a huge movie theater guy, and I was like, I have a nice TV at home. Yeah. And I, you know, I won't, I'd rather pause it and do whatever, I, you know. But as I'm watching more and more stuff, or as I'm going to the theaters more to see more stuff that's coming out contemporary, contemporarily, I'm going, man, this is so much better than <laughs> in, my, in my house. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's that... Um I, I I I I think really what does it for me in theaters is the sound. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, I love seeing the picture big. I th- I I I love being in a warm or a cool dark room. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but especially for horror, like there's nothing like you know the sounds. You know, yeah. being all around you and that and that being so much more of an immersive feeling, at least for me. Um, but yeah, when it comes to especially movies that are you know really focused on uh, like like horror movies do like are focused on bringing you to a certain place and kind of trapping you there mm-hmm. um i think that the horror uh, of uh, a theater helps because you're already in kind of a weird alien environment yeah. in a the theater um so it sort of helps you get to that place yeah that's a good point 
uh, yeah, it does work really well for horror stuff and and stuff being loud. Um, I do like that Alamo plays a lot of older stuff. They they just bring back older movies. Oh, and, yeah. and play them. You can see stuff. I they had it last week or two weeks ago. I didn't get a chance to go see it, but I would have loved to go see the movie Blowback. No, Blowout. I would have loved to see the movie Blowout in theaters. Um, Which one is Blowout? So that's a uh, Brian De Palma film. Early Brian De Palma. John Travolta is a sa- he's a film sound technician. Uh, he's out on a walk at night. He's recording the trees. He's recording some stuff because he needs some like background sounds yeah. for a, a horror movie he's working on. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a car crash and he gets the audio of it and he listens to it a bunch of times and he kind of, he saves the girl who's drowning in the car. Mm -hmm. He goes crazy and he gets embroiled in this like political conspiracy. Oh shit. And he's like, that wasn't, that wasn't a tire blowout. That was a gunshot I heard. And he's like going this whole thing and he goes down the spiral. It's a really, really great movie. And it's a great performance by Travolta. It's actually the performance that got him cast. This was like the his career was like waning already. Yeah. This was the performance that got him cast in uh, Pulp Fiction. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Quentin Tarantino was like, I have to have him because he was so great in this movie. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, um, so I guess yeah. I mean, if uh, and now we have Pulp Fiction to yeah. to. And now that was the last good movie he ever did. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> His, his career was waning, and then it did come back for just a second. It did. Co- I mean, it did come back, but I don't know what he did after. I can't think of a thing he did after Pulp Fiction. Wild Hogs, Wild Hogs, that baby. Was way later. <laughs> oh, and he did that. Come did, back for a third time. <laughs> he did a bunch. Is it really? No. Oh. Um, and then he did a bunch of other stuff that was like, I don't know, not that good since then. But he's got he's got enough bangers. He's got enough, you know. Yeah, classics in the in the can to be like. I think it, once you have a certain amount, it's only fair for you to step down and and be in bad stuff and be bad. Yeah. A bad. Yeah, you might as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can't just keep putting out the hits forever. And, he earned it. Yeah, he's got he's got enough credibility to just be like, did you earned it? Just do some bad stuff or do nothing. You have money. Yeah, yeah. Um. So let's get to let's get to Pearl. Uh, because I genuinely. I mean, I'll say, usually we save reviews for the end, but I mean, there's no secret. I love this movie. Yeah. And you had just seen, you've seen X more recently than I have. I have. Uh, I saw X uh, the beginning of this month, uh, October 1st. Okay. So you watched X right away for your, uh, you're watching a horror movie every day of the month. Yeah. And you're putting a review out of it on your, on your Instagram. Yeah. You want to plug your Instagram? Um, <laughs> you don't have to. I don't know. Yeah, I no, I don't need to. You, don't I, you know, followers. honestly, it's embarrassing because I've been really bad about putting the reviews up lately, especially too. I do look for them every day. Once you told me that, I saw the first few. I was like, oh, good, he's doing it every day. And then I noticed it's like I haven't seen. I one need in a while. to do. I need to do a big dump. You know, it's tough. It's funny. It's it's. This, I guess it's just how my brain works. But it's easier for me to watch a horror movie every day than it is for me to, to update an Instagram account to every do day. A single, yeah. To do a single post. Yeah. It social media is the hardest thing to do it really is terrible <laughs> no it's it's tough but no i'm so every every year for the last f- four or five years now uh i watch 31 horror movies um in october one every day um kind of trying to do it differently every year this year i'm doing um uh, mostly suggestions from other people so i've gotten you know friends and family and stuff to give me suggestions and um it's uh this year's been great uh it started out great with x mm-hmm. um and then Pearl, I think, was the maybe 18th or 17th movie I watched. Wow. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, so let's do a brief X recap. You've seen that more recently. What did you think of X? We'll just do a quick little... Yeah, sure. Um, X is a movie about a group of people who decide to film a pornography movie in uh, in a an old barn just outside of Houston. And the owners of the barn are an old couple who at first just seem like weirdos. And then it turns out that they're murderous weirdos. Yeah. Um, uh, I loved X. Uh, I thought it was really fun. I thought it was um, uh, a really good just homage to movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, to movies like, you know, even, uh, what is it, Last House on the Left. Okay. Uh there's some there's some uh 
Hills Have Eyes influences in there. There's there's a lot of just a lot of great stuff from the seventies. Um, and but it's like there's a fresh a fresh look at it. You know, the characters aren't as one dimensional as they originally seem. You know, not everything is what you think it's going to be. You know, there's the usual horror movie tropes but there's some new stuff mixed in there and i, I don't know I, I thought it was really fun yeah if you that's that's definitely i mean characters to me are always the most important part of any film yeah and um that's the one thing i said on my review of x that came out i don't even remember what episode that was but it was earlier this year it came out in march it was around uh, it was around south by southwest i saw it um but i, I love that the characters had more depth than you know, then you would think you yeah. think you you know you have the you have the blonde, you know, uh, bimbo archetype, but she's actually really, like pretty. She's actually you know really bright and compassionate and had yeah has some great ideas about like the cinematography and stuff like that. Um, all the characters, I don't know, it, it was great. Honestly, and me not being a horror movie guy, I didn't. I wasn't drawing those comparisons to those seventies horror films that you instantly recognized. I immediately thought of Boogie Nights. Oh, okay. Because I'm thinking of the theme. I'm thinking of like the, the setting, the way they're dressed. Well, uh, yeah, and I'm thinking of it's that the end of Boogie Nights, that wild, wild west of we can do, we can make our own porn, uh, pornography on video now. Yeah. So you don't need a you don't need a Burt Reynolds to make it on film mm-hmm. to distribute into theaters. We can make it on you know that's what he that's what they're fighting. That's the downfall of like Burt Reynolds' empire in that movie is video. Yeah, people are starting yeah. to do it. Anybody can do it, and anybody the, can can have have porn. It becomes part. You yeah. know, I mean, that's kind of interesting too because that's that ties in really well to one of the themes of X, which is sex being like kind of the the idea that not being sex positive can make you go crazy. Um, because right, the 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 villains in X are all repressed and twisted and and messed up and that's one of the reasons why they kill is because they don't like the sexuality of the porn stars of the you know the the pornography group that comes into their into their land that they it's too much for them okay i i maybe that's that's a good point i kind of disagree that they it's not that they don't like it necessarily what i the reason i love x is i really love that i really i really love the villains in x pearl yeah um because what i i love the idea of and and the genius of having actress mia goth play yeah maxine and pearl she Mm -hmm. plays the leading lady and she plays the leading villain yeah um and it's that the this idea of of a the elder this old woman going going crazy it's almost like a jealousy thing she's yeah uh she so fervently laments the passing of her youth yeah that that's what drives her crazy and so she she sees somebody she sees herself in these younger people yeah and she can't handle it she can't handle aging well yeah um she can't she can't handle aging and that's what drives her mad, and that's what turns her murderous. And, of course, we get hints in X that she's done this before. Yeah. She didn't snap, you know, when they ring the doorbell at, no. the, at the beginning of no. X. I mean, she's got a guy in her basement yeah. who she's been sexually torturing or whatever. Yeah. So she's she's been down this road before, but that's honestly, that, that theme is what I really loved was this idea of, like, uh, this idea of someone who just can't handle their own mortality, really. They can't yeah. handle their aging. They can't handle the way they look anymore. Um, I thought that was cool, which is why I was hesitant or I was less than super enthusiastic when they announced Pearl. Yeah. Because, I, like I said, I love the idea of this woman, uh, she snaps when she got old, and she just hates. She hates youth because she doesn't have it anymore. Yeah. And then they're like, "We made a prequel, and she's young, and she's still scary." It's like, well, now she's just been a crazy psycho killer her whole life. Yeah. That kind of destroys my that that destroys what I love about it, which is that she that she went crazy in old age because of this uh, this feeling of loss. Interesting. Interesting. So I was not like fully on board with the concept of 
of like the Pearl prequel when it was first announced. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, that's that is interesting um, because I, I had sort of a different a different, uh, I guess, take on the on, on X mm-hmm. in the sense that um, at least by the end of the film, I kind of got the impression that, yeah, that she had always been terrible. Mm-hmm. Like that, like this early on, you think, you know, maybe it's the fact that, yeah, like, you know, she, she talks about being jealous. She sees them. There's a, a great scene where she's watching them film the, the porn mm-hmm. and she's getting this watching specifically uh maxine mm-hmm. um you know having sex with the younger man and she's she's getting this like she's having this effect it's having this effect on her and you're like oh man she's like being overcome with this feeling of like of jealousy and and of of um sort of of jealousy not just of the youth but also the ability to to have sex you know because she's yeah. she's tried to you know right after that scene Mm -hmm. she tries to have sex with her husband and he says he can't you know and she's kind of just like you know wanting what she can't have or wanting what these these young people have yeah you know and i thought was really brilliant um about um pearl at least is they show that she's always been like this like she's Mm -hmm. always wanted what she thinks other people have that she she can't have yeah okay yeah i mean that makes sense you yeah i I can't disagree with that. Um, and we certainly, like I said, I, I went in just kind of hesitant on the concept yeah. of Pearl after walking out with it. I still kind of, I still kind of wish they uh, had had kept it more to what I was thinking, but it's still a fantastic movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now we see, <clears throat> we open up with Pearl and now we see her as a, as a young woman. And before we, even get into like more of the setting what's the exact same setting it's the same yeah same uh farmhouse and all that same kind of stuff yeah i love that yeah so cool i mean they filmed it all at the same time they yeah. even wrote it because it was all filmed in new zealand and uh they wrote it when they first got to new zealand this was when they were filming x you know there was a mandatory two-week quarantine yeah so the whole film production shows up the government says, all right, before you can start working, you have to quarantine in a hotel room for two weeks. They they knew about it. It was built yeah. into their schedule. But while they're sitting around for two weeks, the director and actress Mia Goth, they just they start writing the script. They're yeah. like, let's write a prequel. They, yeah. haven't, they haven't even filmed. They haven't even filmed the movie they're there to film. Yeah. And they're like, we got all this time. Let's write a prequel. And then it they wrote it quickly. It got greenlit before they even started filming so they knew they were going to be doing filming both yeah uh concurrently which is super cool um and then i'm going to say right off the bat my favorite thing when this movie opened up i immediately loved it my favorite thing is just the color the way it looks yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty in an ugly horrifying way <laughs> it was yeah i th- i think it was filmed i think they i think they colored it using technicolor yeah. Which is what every movie was from the 30s. You know, it looks like The Wizard of Oz. The colors are that vibrant and bright. Um, yeah. And, and almost too saturated. It almost, it doesn't, nowadays, because we're so used to like yeah this, we're so used to high definition film and we're so used to, to everything looking a certain way, especially in a movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in a, in a way um some some movies some of the way that we film movies today where there's that sort of gray washed out filter on top of everything yes. we're less vibrant than we were 100 with, with technical that's the thing is everything has become kind of like saturated everything kind of gets a little pallid um if you i hate to keep referring to old episodes of my show but if you watch <laughs> if you watch the, the episode the last duel which is where i was far too me and steve were way too drunk but I was complaining about the movie The Last Duel, um, yeah. and I was I said the word you know Steve made fun of me for saying the word gray like forty times because <laughs> I was just complaining about how how every, how gray everything it, everything because it had he just, they, you know they just throw this filter on it's medieval times mm-hmm. so we have to put this filter on it yeah so many movies just throw a filter on there and it all kind of like yeah washes out this film Pearl has vibrant vibrant colors yeah which does which accomplishes the same 
effect as my favorite one of my favorite things about horror the you know the few horror movies that I do love is anything anytime you can do daytime horror yeah that's why I love Midsummer mm-hmm. I love Midsummer it's very scary and creepy and weird yeah and it happens entirely during the day mm-hmm. it's all if you can make me scared and it's daytime nighttime something jumps out at you it's scary that's that's obvious naturally. Yeah, we all. Um, yeah, we're all scared of the dark. That's easy. That's easy. Yeah, but daytime is like crazy. This is the exact same thing. It's like it's daytime, but it's bright, beautiful colors. Yeah, and you're making me very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 all you know, the that feeling of like, man, is you know, someone's gonna stop this. This can't possibly happen. You know. Yeah. This this horrible thing that's about to happen. You know, like it, bad things don't happen in the light of day like that. You know? Right, not in, not in the beautiful land of Oz with all the you know, cornfield is you know all all this kind of stuff. It's just so yeah, you know, it's so pretty. Everything's so green and lush. Um, just that that di- that juxtaposition of like the the this woman's uh, breakdown compared to the beautiful setting she's in. Yeah, that's not degrading. Is so it it. It's such a like a dichotomy there that that I love that kind of stuff. That's just something I love to see in in movies. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and one thing that I liked about it too, and you know, not to um, belabor comparisons between this and X, but it wasn't filmed in the same. Like, it didn't look the same as X. Right. It looked different. You know, which I think was great because my fear, one of my fears coming into it was like, they're going to make the same movie. Mm-hmm. You know, they made, they just made this movie. They're going to make it again. Like, yeah. you know, it's got even got one of the same actors in it, but it was very different, you know, not just the, the plot and the, and the characters, but the look and the feel. Yeah. I mean, X looked like had that seventies. Yeah. Porn feel. Yeah. You know, that's what they're making. Again, I, I compare, I compare it to boogie nights. X to me looked like boogie nights. Yeah. As far as the way it was filmed, the way things looked, um, and again, this movie looks like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, um, which I know, which was definitely a big inspiration, and and they even do a bunch of references to Wizard of Oz throughout. Um, and yeah, and then of course having Mia Goth in both. Uh, not only she's one of the writers; she wrote this film, co-wrote yeah. it with Ty West, the director. Um, but she starred as both roles in X, and then she plays Young Pearl. And big, I mean, she's great. She's one of my favorite young actresses after seeing these two films. She's even better in this than she was she's in X. E- yeah, yeah, she's much better in this. But, of course, she's she gets all of the screen time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I also just really respect the fact that she's she could be, she could be just a super hot actress looking. She could be in only movies that made her look how look hot and sexy and whatever and i've seen her in two movies and she has no problem like <laughs> she doesn't care about like her real world looks and how good looking she is yeah she puts on the old lady makeup to be the evil yeah old pearl and then she's you know uh, from wearing overalls she's a frumpy farm girl yeah trying to you know uh trying to make it as a something yeah uh in, enticed by gl- the way people look so glamorous on the screen, all kinds of stuff. She has no problem like not looking hot on screen, which means it's just such an authentic, it's such an artistic way to approach your thing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. There's no. There's no point in in Pearl, um, at least, um, you know. And maybe this is this is a, a you know something that I liked about it as post acts, but there's no point where. Any of the characters, uh, where her or any of the characters really are, are, are sexualized for you, for the audience. You know, you mm-hmm. never see her, you know, naked or they never show her really in an appealing way or anything like that. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. there's, there's no like, you know, steamy shower scene or, you know, I mean, there's some steamy scenes, but there's that underlying uncomfortableness about them that, yeah you know you're never watching the, no one's watching this movie you know and, and, and enjoying it in that way oh right yeah there's yeah they're not um none of the, nothing like gratuitous at all or or yeah yeah exactly. exactly at no point is she like i'm i'm a, I'm a movie star i need to be or you know or nobody's saying this to her either not i'm not saying that she would be the one making this call 
but it's so artistically driven. There's no producer over the shoulder like, I think we really need a scene to highlight how sexy <laughs> Mia Goth is. We have a hot young actress. We need yeah. to show the world that she's sexy. No, you don't. She's too she's too much of an artist for that. She's a yeah. She's gonna look like a frumpy farm girl because that's what the art requires. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, I respect the hell out of. I I love seeing that kind of stuff. Um, let's. I guess we'll just start off. It's World War One. It's World War One. It's nineteen. 19- 18, 1917. 19, 7, 1918, because I think it's right towards the end of the war. Yeah, oh, it is. Yeah, it is towards the end of the war. It's been going on for a few years. Pearl and Howard are already married. I was a little surprised by that when they opened up. Yeah. But Pearl's already married. Her husband is away at war. And she's home on the family farm with uh, her mother, who her uh, overbearing mother, and her invalid father. Yeah. That she's taken care of. And she's obviously... She's not happy with her life on the farm. She wants to... She wants to go away from the farm to somewhere yeah. somewhere else. Again, Wizard of Oz comparisons. Totally. Totally. Yeah. She... I mean, early on, you can see she's got dreams of being a dancer, you know, being in, in movies. Um, that very first... Uh, one of the very first scenes is her putting on a show for animals in the barn. Yep. That's right. She's... Dance, she's practicing her dance routine inside the barn. Um, you know, she she has to go into town for errands. She goes to see a movie. She's sitting there at the screen. That that reminded me, you know, her watching the screen, of course, reminded me of uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Mia Farrow in uh, um, what's the Woody Allen movie with Jeff Daniels? Uh, where he. Oh, where he comes, he comes off the screen into her life. I can't believe I'm blanking. Purple Rose of Purple Rose of Cairo. Rose, yep, Purple. Cairo. Yeah, yeah. Purple Rose of Cairo. It's a unhappy woman. Yeah. In a you know different settings, obviously, but just unhappy woman who's fascinated by movies and wants this life of glamour. Um, and so I I always think of that whenever I see somebody who's just forlorn and loves the movies as an escape. Um. Yeah, and there's and even an early on there. They mix it so well with her um, psychopathic tendencies. And it's something they do so well in this film. Whenever you start to feel something for Pearl, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of, sort of feel like, oh, you know, I feel bad for her. I should, you know, she, she needs a break. You know, she's had a tough life. She uh, does something crazy. Like when she, in the very beginning, when she murders a swan. Yeah. um, Just right off the bat in the barn uh, and feeds it to her pet alligator yeah first scene of the movie um with you know what that yeah i actually did kind of forget about that scene but that's (laughs) great and it it shows i think they say one of the early signs you know now that not now but since uh psychologists have been studying like um serial killers and, and studying you know uh studying the tendencies of of uh homicide or homicidal maniacs and these people that are like frequently killers yeah one of the first signs that they recognize that they see that there's a a common thread amongst most killers is like a cruelty to animals when they're young you know we're cruelty to animals that's kind of always like that's dipping your toe into am i going to kill a person someday (laughs) if you you know kill a mouse or a a goose or a whatever you know if you're if you're young if you're you know Dahmer or whoever else I think they all had a history of this kid was like killing animals when he's he this kid was kill, he killed a cat and was happy about it <laughs> it's it's also an important part of the the horror movie structure um so that you can show the audience what the stakes are and yeah. what the characters are capable of without having them go out and murder a person right away, you know, so you can still raise the stakes later. Yeah. So you show in the beginning, you know, like it's so many horror movies, you know, the dog runs outside and they're like, come back, you know, and then he's gone, he's dead, uh-huh. you know, and uh, that's the first sign, you know, and it's, and it's not scary quite yet because it's just a dog or it's just, a, you know, a swan, but you know, like this is how you, know, you and the audience, you know, get ready for, for that to happen to a person. That's very interesting. Yeah. I never noticed that. Yeah. That's great. I, yeah. 
that's the kind of thing I don't I don't pay attention to, but also wouldn't have noticed that that that, ha- that does happen a lot in horror movies. There's always that like, wow, very cool. Um, yeah. So we have it, we have this young woman dreaming of a better life. Yeah. Where do we go next? Do we do we get into spoilers already, or do we have any more setup stuff we want to talk about? Um, I think it's. I'm trying to think what. Uh, so the the inciting incident really like for her is she meets this dude yes um she meets a guy she's out getting medicine for her dad in town Mm -hmm. um she rides her bike into town she takes uh, a little detour to to see the movies Mm -hmm. and then in the alleyway behind the the theater she meets uh this guy who's a projectionist yeah um i'm I'm trying to remember the actor's name i've got it up here somewhere projectionist uh charming dude you know very uh i mean self-described bohemian uh kind of guy film lover he lives in the projection room you know he moves from town to town he's got this job until he doesn't and he's not worried about it david corn sweat david corn sweat <laughs> no i don't think it's corn <laughs> let me let's see if i pronounce corn corn sweat corn sweat corn sweat okay Cor- um, David Corn Sweat. David Corn Sweat. <laughs> uh, he was good. He was he was really good. Um, especially, oh, especially later. Yeah, he's he's um, I and I think this is maybe my only issue with the movie. Okay. Uh, is a lot of the supporting cast is just not as fleshed out or maybe as interesting as the supporting cast was in X. You know, and yeah. you know, here I am comparing it again. But you just out, even outside of that, like some of the supporting cast in this, not all of it. You know, I think the mother was really well done. Even, mother was even incredible. the dad <laughs> does some great acting and has some great character development without ever saying a word in the film. Um, but yeah, uh, the the projectionist, um, you know, his his name in the film. What is his name in the film? I think they just call him the projectionist. Yeah, you're right. They never I don't know name. If he, they, I, I don't know if they they name him. Yeah, um, the projectionist. He doesn't really. Uh, I guess he serves kind of as a as a vessel for for some of Pearl's, you know, madness to come out. But he doesn't really. Nothing he does in the film is especially I think interest was especially like interesting or noteworthy to me. You know. Um, okay. I actually really, I. I actually really liked him because he had a couple of moments and one of them is writing and the other one was he had. So he had one moment that was like, I thought he did a really good job of acting and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that right now. We're going to get into spoilers. Oh, okay. We're cool. just going to get into it right now. Um, yeah. They if, start pretty quick in this one. So yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, we won't be just going through beat by beat, like everything that happens, but the few things that are, that I resonate with or, or really not even resonate with, but really gravitated towards or really liked. Um, there's this one section that particularly I want to talk about and then, uh, that, but that'll be in our spoiler section. So if you don't want to hear spoilers about this film, I would suggest you skip to one hour and 14 minutes and then you can skip to that part. That'll be the end of our review. We'll do our whatever and you won't hear spoilers. All right. <clears throat> okay, cool. Gloves are off. Um, here's where we'll be talking about, I guess, about the kills, really. Yeah. Um, there's only four kills in this movie. Are you counting the goose? No, I'm not counting okay, the goose. Okay, so we're talking just people. Um, yeah, four. Yeah, um, which, which is, is... Which is a lot. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot for a 19-year-old girl... It's a lot for a 19-year-old girl. It's not in, a, in the span of 24 hours. It's a, it's, it's a bit. It's not a lot for a for a film like a slot, you know, a, a slasher film, but it yeah. is but it is they're all they're so effective that you really don't even feel like it's not a lot. I exactly. I agree with you 100%. I've seen movie, you know, the the scream monster killed 10 teenagers or whatever, you know. Yeah. But that stuff whenever there's like a, a real slasher villain you know some dude with a mask yeah freddy jason whatever cutting people down you know walking through the subway just slashing people's heads <laughs> off that means nothing to me i'm not a, 
I'm not a big fan of those kind of horror films. Yeah. Pearl just degrading. Everybody she kills is somebody meaningful to her. Yeah. She only has she only has four people in her life. Yeah. When the you know well she has three people in her life and then she meets the projectionist and she kills all four she she kills all four of them. She basically kills anyone who gets close to her in this movie. Yeah, that's but again, she's a farm girl, she's isolated, she doesn't yeah. have a lot of friends. The only people in her life are the people around her. Um and that kind of shows her mania is how even even the people most important to her in the world and the people that love her the most yeah are the ones she hurts the most mhm um, you know she should make she should have some more casual friends <laughs> honestly not everybody you know hang she out should, with she should she should go to a mental hospital yeah <laughs> she should be imprisoned i know <laughs> she- i wrote uh, cuz the whole a big theme of of this is pearl her self, you know, self esteem issues, and, yeah. and the way she feels about herself, and she, she feels like she's destined for better things, and she, she sees, she, you know, she sees these beautiful women on screen. Um, she sees all these other women at the at the dance contest and all this kind of stuff, um, the dance audition, and she's so she's so obsessed with looking better. The entire time I'm watching this movie, I'm just going, man, I am so glad that she never got an Instagram account because that would have really <laughs> fucked up her self esteem. Yeah, I know. Just wait till um, Maxine comes out. Well, maybe we'll see some some wrinkle of that. Yeah, we'll see um, what happens if uh, in in the the third part of this trilogy, which I just re- I just found out about today. Oh, really? Did you did you see the the preview for it at the end of the film? No, I didn't. Okay, I didn't see it either. I don't know if they even played it, but apparently, just the same way they announced Pearl, they did a pre they did a trailer for Pearl at the end of X. In some theaters, they did a trailer for Maxine at the end of Pearl. Oh, really? So Maxine is going to be a sequel to X. It's going to take place in 1985 with um, Maxine, played by Mia Goth, having survived this murderous yeah. thing. She goes to L.A. and she's part of the L.A. 80s pornography scene. That's cool. Um, another, speaking of, another great film, Star 80. Star 80? No, I haven't seen it. Incredible. It's a, It's about a... Uh, it Eric, it it it's great. I just watched that a couple weeks ago when we were talking about movies we watched recently. I should have brought that up first. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Star Eighty is great. Um, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Where were we? Back to back to Pearl. Uh, having these self esteem issues. The pro- projectionist shows some interest in her. Yeah. Her husband's away at war. She has a strange man. Showing interest in her, telling her she's beautiful, yeah, uh, and she, you know, has such a unfulfilling home life that she runs to this guy's arms. Yeah, um, she has a very stern German mother and, and an uh, invalid father who she has to take care of, and who obviously gives her nothing because he he can't really emote. Yeah, yeah, and she, uh, well, you kind of get the sense too that like he's the only man in her life and she sort of does, you know, she has these, these feelings, these like, you know, sexual or, you know, whatever feelings of a 19 year old has. Um, and cause there's some awkward moments between them early on in the film as well. Um, where she's sort of, you know, bathing in front of him, uh-huh. and, you know, putting her arms around him and, and, and making us all uncomfortable in the theater, of course. Okay. Interesting. You know, what's funny I didn't even think of it that way. Um, I saw that as kind of just an old... I, I saw that more in the sense of um, when she's like taking... She's taking a bath in front of her father. After she bathes him and then she, she gets in. She says, I don't want to waste the hot water. Yeah. Um, I get that sense. Not that there was... Maybe, maybe I just missed it. I didn't get that sense that, that she is... Um, I didn't get a sexual sense from it at all. What I got from that was she considers her father to be dead. Yeah. Oh, I see. Interesting. It means nothing to her to be naked in front of her father. Mm-hmm. She is so she's already written him off. Yeah. Which is why she hate she hates this burden that her she hates that her mother has to constantly burden her with taking care of her father and bathing him and cleaning his shorts and cleaning his pants and all yeah. kind of stuff. 
the fact that she can just get naked in front of him and and I I wasn't feeling like he, he's the only you know I didn't see that like young young woman you know in love with a father I didn't see any of that sexual stuff I just saw like she thinks he's dead already yeah that's Interesting. how I read that yeah their their relationship is interesting um i can definitely see that too um she sort of just you know doesn't you know talks to him all the time but doesn't really like it's not like she's having a conversation it's more like she's just unloading on him yeah um you know and 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 this is maybe one of the most horrifying parts about the movie for me in everything that happens i'm pretty sure he's fully conscious and aware of everything that's going on it did seem that way, especially like you mentioned, he had some great acting in it. He he did do a good job of you know near the end. He you could see his his eyes are getting big. Yeah, he he is. I guess he is like locked in or trapped in syndrome or whatever that's called. I think locked in syndrome. But he's yeah. just like you know his eyes are getting big. He's his eyes are darting back and forth, yeah. looking for like looking exactly. for something to yeah. save him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, so he's. He, seeing a lot of horrific things and can do nothing yeah so he just has you know we don't even know what his affliction is but it's the, the stephen hawking thing where he can't move at all yeah can't move his arms can't move his anything but his eyes you can uh near the end you can see some intelligence behind his eyes i didn't notice that at first yeah in the first few scenes he definitely seems checked out um well we can i mean Let's. I mean, since we're talking about spoilers, yeah, we're uh, spoilers. Say whatever you want. Um, you know, there's a there's a scene where she sets her mother on fire, mm -hmm. s sort of sort of accidentally, but you know, definitely the uh, sets her mother on fire, burns her badly, um, and then pushes her down the stairs into the basement. Yeah. Um, you know, leaves her down there to die. Uh, her father sees the whole thing, and I think that's when you first start seeing the terror in his eyes you know yeah i think that was i agree i think that was what kind of woke him up to the that's when i started that's when i started seeing um some life behind his eyes yeah exactly exactly and that's you know I, her mother doesn't die at that point she takes her a few days to die but that's yeah. the first sort of you know violent thing we see pearl do to but, another person yeah to that's a, like the inciting incident there mm -hmm. is that interaction with her mother they get in a fight she she pushes her down the stairs and then she takes her dad and wheels him into another room and then just leaves him there yeah for a day days leaves him there because she's tired of the burden of like caring for him and she uses that time and here's uh well, before that, part of the thing that starts that fight, because this this connects to my uh, my one of my favorite scenes, yeah, with the projectionist. Um, but part of what starts that fight is the mother being very cruel. But we see the mother at some point. Usually, we think she's just stern for german reasons or she's stern for <laughs> stern for german reasons or stern for farmer reasons <laughs> you know yeah she's a 1920s farmer yeah you know her she's she should be standing next to her husband with a pitchfork just looking dour yeah we think she's like stern for that reason but during this fight that that leads to the the fire and the burning and all kinds of stuff yeah the mother reveals that she's like part of the reason I'm I treat you this way is because I see I see some fucked up shit behind your eyes I yeah. I see the I see the badness in you yeah it's a very mean thing to say to your daughter well and I mean I think that there's some implication there that she sees some of the terrible things that her daughter has done too like cruelty to animals yeah and... I think she's seen her daughter uh, kill some kill some animals you know who knows what. Uh, but yeah, she's like, I see this evil in you. Yeah, and that's why I don't. That's why I don't want you leaving this farm. Yeah. So she, you know, she's like, I'm protecting the world from you. Yeah. By, by keeping you here, cleaning up your father's mess and working here and doing stuff like that. Yeah. I'm doing a good deed for the world. I don't know if I don't know how much how true that is. It's still a little. Uh, 
abusive to not let your daughter go out and have any fun and have some friends. Maybe if she had some more casual friends, <laughs> she could have calmed down a little bit, Ma. M- maybe, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, but but I, you know, and I think that it, one of the the interesting things too with her fight with her mom is is kind of this idea that she's that no matter what her parents or friends or this guy or whoever can give her, it's mm-hmm. never going to be enough for her. Yes, that's true. We find that out later. We do find, I mean, we find that out later, but we get that, like, you know, her mom's kind of just like, you're ungrateful, you know? And, it, you know, and it's kind of like, she sucks. She's terrible. Yeah. Um, but you definitely, uh, upon, you know, in retrospect, she was, she was pretty right about Pearl about, and, and about, you know, the, yeah, she was, I mean, maybe she Although, pushed her into into yeah. some of this too, though. Look, nurture versus nature is a conversation yeah. you can have about anything, um, any type of like you know family environment. The thing, even more so than um, what the the mother talks about, Pearl being ungrateful and not being happy with what she has. Yeah, um, that's true. I guess what I saw even more than that, I think, is. That she doesn't handle rejection. That's that's the big thing that mm, that's the big yeah. thing that I saw multiple times that that destroyed her every time. So yeah. the mother she her mother rejects her when her when they have this fight. The mother says, "I see evil behind you. That's why I keep you here because I I know I know deep down you're rotten or whatever." She yeah. says she says it much more eloquently than I'm dumbly saying it. <laughs> um, she gets she's rejected by her mother yeah and she they start this fight accidentally you know end up seriously injuring her mother intentionally throwing her mother down the stairs and letting her just burn to death down there then she goes and she she goes to seek out the validation of the only other man in her life yeah the projectionist yeah and they spend the night together um in a very you know I'm going to say it's a nod to uh, Taxi Driver. Movie, uh, movie theater's closed. Yeah. He, he's like, let me put on a special movie for you. I'm immediately, my brain going, I know what this is. And I was right. Yeah. It's, it's, he shows her a, a pornographic film, her first time seeing that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, again, that I don't know how influenced that was, but I can't think, I can't not think of Taxi Driver when I see that. Um, anyway, they spend the night together. He goes back with her to the farm. They are intimate again in the farmhouse or in at the, or maybe it gets interrupted by, they're, the, by they're, the knocking yeah, at the door. Uh, the, the mother's still alive and yeah. she's trying, she's pounding at the, the cellar door trying to get let out. Either way, maybe they don't have sex a second time. They think they start something and then it does get interrupted. Yeah. Uh, the, the projectionist being a normal dude is just like, well, let's go check out that sound. Anyway, she drags him back out to the farm, shows him all the farm stuff. And then... Once again, in, in a moment that really like resonated with me, she I don't maybe I don't even remember what it was, but that's good that you don't remember exactly what it was. She does something that shows her weirdness. She's she's lying. She gets caught in a lie. She's she's lying about. Um, she says it's their dog inside. Oh yeah, you know. And then he asks her about her dog, and she says we don't have a dog. You know. Yeah. He's like, you just told me you had a dog. That's right. She ca- she gets caught in a lie. A few minutes. Yeah, but she's already she's starting to unravel. I think too, uh-huh. like, and he's he can pick up on that. That's the thing is he picks up on this little thing, and she's, and she's self conscious about it, and he. And, but it's it's that thing, and it, it has happened so many times, especially if you're like trying to date. Which I know this is like, <laughs> it's dumb to be like, dating is hard 2022 to compare that to this horror movie. But it is like, you know, you're you're out with somebody and then... It's timeless. Yeah. it's At some point, some point it turns when mm-hmm. it's like, oh, this isn't... This isn't fun anymore. Either, and you feel it, no matter what side you're on. If, if you're the one that's like rejecting them or you're the one getting rejected, you feel like, you're like, oh, wait, what, did we just have that moment? What happened? What did I yeah. do? And so she has that moment where she feels it. Turn. He doesn't say he doesn't say the wrong thing. He doesn't say anything. He, He's just like his demeanor changes. Yeah, a little he bit. just like he just cools on her. Yeah, and she's like, "What? Why are you doing? What? What did I do?" 
and he can't give her an answer. <laughs> yeah, you just like no, you weirded me out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, it's just I just feel different. We're humans. We just you know we're running off vibes, as yeah. we say, and they just turned weird. Uh, and it's great for the audience too, because especially knowing what we know and knowing you know at that point, mm-hmm. the vibes turn for us at that moment too, and we're like, oh man, this guy's gonna die now. Yeah, <laughs> and again, so she can't handle rejection. She has a second rejection of the film and it ends up, she kills, she, she has to kill him. Yeah. And she doesn't have to, <laughs> she, she could have been cool, but it's too late for that. Now <laughs> she's already killed somebody. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that, that results in, in him getting murdered, uh, with a pitchfork, right? Yeah, she stabs him to death with a pitchfork, which yeah. is how uh, how the cinematographer died in in X. Yeah, how the that di- was the, the director pitch- guy died. Oh, the director was pitchfork through the eyes. Pitchfork through the eyes. Yeah, yeah. So same kind of thing. And then the car goes into the lake. She drives the car into the lake to bury. A it. lot more realistic this time. I, I I I'm pretty sure you could get killed by a pitchfork into your chest. I don't know. You'd have to stab someone really hard in the eyes to kill them with a pitchfork. Are you kidding that way no two inches from your eyes is your brain yeah but there's like there's bones there and and uh, she stabbed him perfectly through the two little holes in the thing it was it was just that's true i don't know how wide <laughs> pitchfork tines are yeah so maybe that's maybe just that's it, movie magic it seemed a little bit convenient but you know? i feel like i feel like i could die with a toothpick in my eye <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> you know i think it's i think because the second you're one centimeter past your eye is my brain and then it's all over um hey you'll be surprised um what's his name uh there was that guy uh jonathan gage or something uh phineas gage yeah that was his name uh he's famous for having a uh during a railroad construction accident having a metal spike shot through his skull uh, coming in Damn. under his chin and then just out through his eye, like above his eye. Uh, and he survived. He was fine. But his whole personality changed afterwards. Yeah, he was fine. What is he was fi- what is fine? He made a full recovery and was was a functional person. Lived for years afterwards. But he How apparently his personality change? became a, a just a mean, nasty person afterwards. Yeah, that seems not chill. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't great, but he, yeah. he was, I mean, he was a dick, but he was fine. Uh, it's actually was one of the inspirations for lobotomies for why they started doing lobotomies. They were like, if we could take out a piece of a person's brain and change them, oh. this is such a diversion. But no, that's right. That's, that's, that's what it's about. <laughs> uh, interesting. Phineas Gage. I'll have to look yeah. into that. Check him out. Yeah. yeah. I, know, I know lobotomies were not cool. <laughs> <laughs> lobotomies Look, are not cool we don't take a lot of hard stances this is supposed to be a fun podcast this yeah. is not a political podcast but i'm here to say lobot- lobotomies are not chill america this yeah this man is saying what we're all thinking yeah <laughs> i don't want anybody to get confused if you thought this was a pro lobotomy podcast you're in the wrong place buddy i don't care and i don't even care if we lose fans yeah i don't care if you unsubscribe <laughs> i hope you do um so well, that's her second rejection. Uh, then she then she kills her dad. After that, yeah, she kills her dad. After that, um, um, I don't know if there's. I think that that's just cleaning up. Yeah, she seems to feel bad for it in the same way that you would feel bad for like an animal that you would put down. Yeah, you know, she's get kind of has that approach with it. She's just like, well, I can't take care of you anymore, and it's cruel to leave you here. So I'm gonna smother you with yeah. a with a cloth. If I'm really trying to, if I'm really trying to dig deep and justify my uh, rejection uh, through line, I can say, you know, she considered his lack of emotion a rejection of her. Yeah. You know, but whatever. That's just me trying to be smart. Well, she doesn't. You know, it's. I think it's one of the. It's one of the few kills that doesn't happen in a passion. It's more calculated. That's a great point. That's that's when she's really crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, that's because that's where you really see that she is. Uh, she's a sociopath, you know. Yeah. She she's just like, well, sorry, daddy. Like, I'm I'm getting out of here, and you you know, you're holding I, me I back. can't. Yeah, you're holding me back. So this is unfortunate, but this is what needs to happen. You know, that's a really good point because that is that is the true. I mean, you know, 
you get you get angry and riled up. You accidentally, you know, you kill your mom in a fight. Who hasn't done that? You, yeah, you get rejected. <laughs> you get rejected by some hot guy, artist guy that that you like. Uh, and then he tries to drive away. You kill him. Look, that happens dozens of times. <laughs> that happens. That happens every day. All right, in uh, in America, but. Yeah, the the true evil is like just calculatedly killing a you know invalid father. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have our final rejection. I guess it's kind of a two parter. She's she's rejected from her audition. She doesn't get the part. Yeah, that she auditions for. Yeah, she goes to audition for a traveling um, dance troupe. That dances at churches all over the state. Yeah, which which she's kind of. I guess she heard about it through the project projectionist early on, no, she and she heard then, about it from her sister in law. Oh, from her sister in law. You're right. Yeah, she yeah. So she hears about that from her sister in law, who's also going to audition. Another young woman, dissatisfied with, uh, you know, living in a farm town, but not to not to such great extents as Pearl. Yeah, and Mitzi. You, yeah, and you get the idea early on too that her family is doing a lot better than Pearl's family. Yeah. Um but there's sort of a it seems like there's sort of a some some a break there. A break you know, the the families don't necessarily get along. Yeah, well again the mother that's the other thing why I don't necessarily believe the mo- that's why I don't have a ton of sympathy for Pearl's mom being like because she turns down the help from yeah because you know. she's not just she's not just a kind person who is, is willing to accept a gift from her sister or you know her daughter's mother-in-law yeah she you know her they bring over the pig she could easily you know don't think of it as charity think of it as a family member bringing you a nice meal that yeah. happens all the time and you get the sense that she's sort of a bitter prideful person too yeah she sucks and so I don't believe this whole martyrdom of like, I have to take care of my father and I have to protect the world from you because you're a bad girl. Like, relax. No, you, first of all, that's not what you're doing here. I don't fully believe you. I think I think the mother's not cool. Um, but so Pearl gets rejected from the you know by the dance troupe. It devastates her. Great, very interesting dance uh, scene. Yeah, where she, she kind of hallucinates all this other stuff going on, and 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 she's in this different world, and I did like that. Yeah, know. no, that was cool. She sort of has a, a what a waking dream sequence where she imagines a whole chorus line of of girls dancing with her, and she's all made up, and she's dancing for the troops, I guess, on yeah. uh, in a very sort of a, a a maybe a little bit too realistic and cr- scary looking. Battleground. Battleground. Yeah, that's not where that's not where the USO show. The USO show doesn't go to the <laughs> trenches. Yeah, yeah. In, uh, in in France or Germany or wherever this war is taking place. There's so many little like horror aperitifs in this movie, and uh-huh. that's one of them. Um, little things that are just off, just not right. Uh, and I love that scene. That's it's it's unsettling in a completely different way, I think, than than some of the other scenes in the movie. Yeah, and it is cool just to have a have this interlude of like a weird dance number any any sort of anytime you can fit a musical number in a movie especially if it's a scary musical number like yeah more power to you yeah because she could have they could have like pearl come on in and then the door closes and then she storms out you know yeah they could have just not shown us that at all yeah you know but they they show us her trying her best she gets rejected and uh her sister-in-law mitzi drives her misty mitzi 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 drives her home and uh, they sit in the living room, or they sit in the in the kitchen, or dining at the dining table. We have the most impressive display of acting is Pearl's monologue. Yeah, yeah, very long six minute monologue. It's long, and then all done, all done in a single take. So not not which does not necessarily mean it was done on the first take. But it's it's one take. Even though there are cuts uh, spliced in, uh, there are some reaction shots. The actual filming of the monologue was a, a is done you know single take. Yeah, and we see Pearl. Mia Goth gives an incredible, compelling monologue. I generally don't like a six minute monologue. If I'm being totally honest. Yeah, usually. Um, I mean, yeah. If you told me to listen to 
somebody talk for six minutes, I'd have a hard time. Yeah. Um, but this, this was great. You know, I mean, the, the range of emotion that she shows, the sort of confession that the setup for it is great. You know, Mitzi is like, okay, talk to me as though I were your husband and tell him everything. You can tell me anything. Exactly. You know, but the cool thing about it is what she's saying is talk to the audience yeah as if they're you know uh, to talk to say directly you know to the audience and then the camera turns and we're in mitzi's place mm-hmm. and uh pearl just talks to us you know about basically about how she's decided that she needs howard so bad she needs someone so bad that she doesn't care if she uh goes out into the world and 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 leaves the farm yeah she's given up on her dreams she's willing to stay there for him she's been she's been rejected the only person that hasn't rejected her is howard uh, yeah because he you know he's often he's he's off fighting um anyway mitzi makes a rookie mistake of like you know talking to her friend her friend being like, I've got some darkness in me. And Mitzi's like, it's probably not that big of a deal. Why don't you tell me all about it? And I mean, Mitzi's just trying to be a good friend. She's trying, but rookie mistake. Because your friend has more. You, She thinks it's going to be some little nonsense. Yeah. You know, some some mod. You know, she's a, she thinks it's going to be a moderate. You know, oh, yeah. I've felt that, too. And <laughs> yeah. then Pearl drops a neutron bomb of crazy on her. And, and she was not prepared for it. And that's how. And then that's our final rejection which of course leads to our final so mitzi after hearing all this has to pretend like i'm cool with all that very obviously not and then she's backing away too trying to get out of here pearl cannot allow this well here's the interesting thing about that scene too because i kind of got the feeling that from the moment that pearl told that stuff to mitzi she was intending to kill her okay Interesting. Like, there's nothing that Mitzi can do. Her fate is sealed upon hearing hearing that confession from, from yeah. Pearl. Well, true, because Pearl already hasn't made up in her mind that Mitzi won the part. Yeah, exactly. And, Which and we don't know if she did or not. I think she didn't. I don't. I think she didn't as well. Mitzi w- was forced. Pearl forced Mitzi to say that she got it. I don't think she did. Yeah. I think she just said it because I think she said yes because Pearl so forcefully told her to say yes. Yeah. And she was just trying to end the conversation. Well, and the really tragic thing is I don't think Mitzi went out for the part at all. I think she cuz she cuz she's in front of Pearl. Uh-huh. In line. She chickens out. She says, "You go ahead." She and then when Pearl comes out, Mitzi's like, "Oh, you're feeling bad. Let's go home." Well, I think she skips the audition for her friend to take care of her friend and for this trouble ends up getting murdered for it. That I mean, okay, that's funny. I thought I was I thought you were I thought that was gonna be um funnier. I thought you were like, the really tragic part is that Mitzi didn't even have the courage to audition. It's like that's not the most tragic part. <laughs> I th- the yeah. murders of it, but I see what you mean. I see what you're saying now. It's tragic because she's like she 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 really is like a good friend, you know. You I yeah, I don't know. I I don't think I don't think we know how much time because all we see is after after Pearl's audition after they re- after they reject her, we see her sitting on the stairs crying. Yeah. on a different part of the building, and then eventually Mitzi shows up to console her. Yeah, we don't know how much time elapses yeah, we, between those yeah. two scenes. It might have been enough time for Mitzi to do her audition. It might not have been. Um, I think it's 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 left up to the audience to decide whether or not she did get this part. And therefore deserve to get murdered or not. <laughs> I see. I don't think. I think that. Um, and that's why. Uh, the, there's. You know. That's one of the best things about. Um, about horror movies. Is that there is this whole. Like built up already framework. Where like people transgress. And then they get killed. You know you walk down into the basement. You, you it was dumb you know you you read from the book yeah you you open the door you go off by yourself to the woods you help the person who's you know whatever you you know yeah. you make this you you know you trust this person that you shouldn't trust um uh and i think that some of the some of the most effective scenes or you know deaths or kills in, in horror movies are when the person 
really doesn't deserve it. Uh, mm-hmm. And you kind of think up and maybe up and even till the end that there's a chance that they aren't going to die. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I think one of the best parts about that scene with Mitzi is that like, <laughs> you know, that she's going to get killed. Yeah. But there's you, you, you know, she, you, you and her both kind of have that slight, slight hope, you know, when Pearl just lets her leave, you're like, Oh man, maybe she's going to get away. Yeah. And then, and this is, a, I think one of my favorite parts of the, one of my all, you know, top, five favorite parts of the film is you see Pearl coming out of the house behind her Mm -hmm. going to the chopping block and taking the ax and just, you know, sort of slowly walking and then quick, quickly walking behind Mitzi as she realizes that she's done for. Yeah. Yeah. No, it it was a very, very, it was a great murder scene um, with an ax to a poor woman lying on the ground. (laughs) I mean, yeah. Yeah. uh, You know, brutal that might have been the most brutal murder scene that was the one that was most uh i don't know um i it was it was the one i think where the person saw it coming the most yeah yeah well maybe except for the mom but you know where the person was aware that they were being killed (laughs) yeah uh very and then you know in a pure so weird thing is she puts all the bodies not all of them not all the bodies because uh, Mitzi gets thrown into the lake with the with the projectionist to, yeah. the, to the alligator. Mom and dad get reunited at the dining table. They're corpses. And then Howard comes home. He walks into this scene. Pearl sitting at the dining table with her dead mom and dad. Yeah. And he doesn't reject her. <laughs> thus, thus ensuring he lives long enough to see the movie X get made. Yeah, that's... That's he doesn't reject her, and we we don't even see him accepting her. We just know it happens. Yeah, they're we still just, together, and yeah, in, we just know X. it happens. Um, and then, <clears throat> uh, yeah, because I have a question for you. Yeah, um, do you think Howard, while he was in Europe, do you think he got any pussy? <laughs> <laughs> because that determines how cool he's going to be when he walks into a disaster area. Because frankly, if he's in France having sex with beautiful French women. On his uh, on his shore leave, yeah, he gets home to this murderous wife and a bunch of dead bodies. Yeah, he might be like, I don't need this. <laughs> but if he hasn't had sex all of World War One, he finally gets home. He's like, I got to put up with this girl. <laughs> this is my only shot. He's like, he's like, he's like, well, you know, it's been it's it's been a long time, but <laughs> it's like, oh, I've, I've put up I've put up with worse. To sleep with a woman yeah yeah at least i'm not at least i'm not being shot at in a trench yeah i do think that like so you really only <laughs> i think i don't think my theory is that he did not yeah i think he had a really bad time over there probably uh and um they kind of allude to it a couple times from like his letters and stuff but uh-huh. i think that he's like just in the right place to like be like well all right, and accept her with open arms when she comes back. Yeah, if, if when he comes abstin- back, if you've been abstinent for the entirety of World War One, you come home with your wife expecting to get laid. You're going to put up with quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, um, and then the other thing is uh, a quick reference to X. Um, after after Bobby Lynn gets eaten by the crocodile. Uh, old man Howard asks old Pearl, this is back in X, is a, is is that the one you're obsessed with? Pearl goes, you know I don't like blondes. Yeah. Maybe a reference to the fact that, you know, the what happened during her audition, one of the reasonings for her not being yeah. s- selected. Uh, she has this uh, vendetta against blondes. Yeah, because she she's carries. not blonde. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, she so, mentions it to Mitzi, too. She's like, you got the part because you're blonde. Yeah. Yeah. So just little stuff like that. Uh, perhaps this is the end of spoilers. Maybe those. Maybe I'll edit those two <laughs> into the actual spoilers. This is the real end of spoilers, folks. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say before we talk about the close the closing credits? Um, no, I I don't think so. Oh, uh, there's a there's like it's a small scene, um, but it's early on. Uh. And it's just, it's just a, it's a fun scene. I don't even really know what it means, but I just didn't want to forget about it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
she takes an egg from the alligator's nest. Yeah. Puts it up and puts it up oh, in yeah. the in the farmhouse in the hay like she's going to take care of it. You're kind of like, oh, is this going to be a subplot? And then not too much further in the film, she gets angry and she crushes it. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think that's a fun that was a, that was fun because, you know, it's this idea of like, oh, could I, cr-, you know, like she can't even have something, you know. Yeah. There's nothing she can take. There's care nothing of. she can take care of because she'll just kill it in anger. You know, maybe it explains why her and Howard never had kids. Oh, you know, that's a good point. That, I mean, that maybe that's like I a, could see that. Maybe that's the analogy for she has this egg. She has this thing she could care for. Yeah, and she just whenever she gets angry, she <laughs> take she takes out her anger on something and she destroys this. She destroys something before she even has a chance yeah. to care for it to maturity or whatever. Anyway, yeah, that's the only. Uh, that is a, yeah, that was. A, I forgot about that little scene. That was it's just a, a little it's thing. A, it's a fun little scene. I, I think. Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's. That's one thing I really liked about this film is there are so many little scenes, little asides where you're just like, oh, like, here's a little, a, a, a tiny little thing that maybe gives me more information um, than it leads on to originally. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, this movie was filled with that. Of course, there was a bunch of uh, you know references towards little things that happen in X, different yeah. phrases and stuff. Uh, you know, some of those phrases, I, I covered some of that stuff in my X episode way back in the day. Um, I wish I knew what number that was, but I don't care badly enough to look it up. <laughs> All right. Last thing, super, really, really impressed me again with Mia Goth's performance. Great long monologue, but also closing credits. Yeah. Was originally supposed to be, he was going to film her smiling. Ty West, the director, is going to film Mia Goth smiling at Howard at, when he returns. Um, and he was going to pick, like, the most creepy still image of that. Yeah. And that was going to be a freeze frame. She smiled. She held the smile for three minutes and just did this mirac- this incredible, like, again, this deterioration from, like, a happy smile. Yeah. And she just holds it. So, like, it. a desperate sort of... yeah pained smile and it gets weird and as an audience member you're finding it like oh this is funny this is creepy this is really discomfitting it it you go down this rabbit hole of like yeah please tell her to stop smiling please call cut <laughs> say please cut. stop yeah stop this scene yeah it's so the great. entire time the credits are rolling you just see you're just looking into this weird smiley you know she's the joker pearl pearl's the joker <laughs> She's doing this weird smile, staring into your soul and being weird, and it's it's great. It's honestly little kind of stuff like that. Being able to hold that kind of pose and do all this different stuff with it. Mia Goth is a tremendous actress. Yeah, she is. She really is. Um, she kills it. Uh, and I I actually really look forward to seeing her do more stuff. I can't wait for Maxine. Yeah, me too. I, as much as I you know I I don't know as much as I hate everything you know I hate that we're in the X cinematic universe now. Yeah, that, that it was so fast too. I know. I hate that everything. But again, these are low budget, you know, story first, yeah. well done horror movies. They did the first two in the exact same setting, so I don't mind it. The fact that they're just gonna, you know, I hope it doesn't. I don't know. Again, I I don't like that everything has to get turned into a franchise, but these are are part two was artistic enough to justify itself. Yeah. So hopefully, Maxine. In the eighties, nineteen eighty five in L A. Who knows? I mean, you know, what that's gonna look at like. least it's good. They're good. You know, they're they're, they're yeah. not making they're not they're not pumping these movies out as just as a a cash cow or whatever. They're they're yeah. they're putting effort into them. Certainly not these first two. I no, don't, I don't know yeah. what the you know, but they've gotten enough credibility off the first two for me to for me to be excited about the third one. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. So. I can't imagine they're like, we did two for art and we're going to do the third for money. Who I don't know. <laughs> two for art, third for money. That's, you yeah. know. <laughs> two for me, you know, two for you, one for me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, anyway, Andres, thank you so much, man, for doing this episode. You were so great to talk to you about Oh, it. yeah, you too, man. Uh, any Anything you want to plug? You, you you can shout out a, a something? Is no, nothing? I've got nothing to plug. All right. You're just a, you're just a movie expert. Who Eat likes your to talk vegetables. About it. There we go. Yeah, take care of yourself. It's Halloween time. Yeah. Don't eat too much candy. And do like, if you're doing, if you're going to do canned vegetables versus frozen vegetables, do do frozen. Um, oh, canned yeah. vegetables have so much more sodium. Um, you're just like not getting all the health Oh, yeah. And indivi- IQF, individually quick frozen vegetables, are just as healthy as fresh. Yeah. No. Pea, you know, that's what, frozen peas are 
as good, if not probably better than fresh peas. They're, totally. They're frozen in nitrogen instantly. You can't even tell the difference, folks. All right. Uh, as always, I'm uh, follow Let's Get Trashed on Twitter. Follow Let's Get Trashed on Instagram. Um, at Nick Tazo Drums, all that stuff. I'm very easy to find. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.